Welcome back to another episode of What Happened. If you look down at the title below, you'll see Batman and Robin and- Oh crap, wait, Rich No Parents Man movie has already been out in theaters for more than a week. I forgot to take advantage of the eldritch power of algorithmic synergy. <laughs> eh, so let's just do it now, who cares? And no, this isn't about the equally awful PlayStation game of the same name. God, there are so many Batman games I can still cover. I, I already did Dark Tomorrow, there's Batman Forever, Batman Beyond, and oh, by the way, quick shout out to the Bitmap Books' latest release, Go Straight, a fantastic comprehensive tome that catalogs every beat-em-up you can even think of. Yes, even those aforementioned piles of bat crap, but the good ones too. It's available now in limited quantities, so check the description below for more info. Anyway, Batman's movie career has also had the occasional misstep, and really, there's none bigger than today's subject. So, what happened to Batman and Robin? Alright everyone, chill! It's 1995, and Warner Brothers' gamble to continue the Batman film franchise without Tim Burton is paying off big time. While choices like Jim Carrey as the main antagonist and a mid-series bat actor swap were seen as risks, Batman Forever was unquestionably the success of that summer, blowing Batman Returns' box office haul out of the sky and making a decent amount of cash off the massive toy and merch rollout. What goes on inside Batman's head? Joel Schumacher, famous for past cinematic greats like St. Elmo's Fire and The Lost Boys, had been chosen to take up the mantle of director. He was genuinely passionate about the source material and immersed himself in all eras of the hero's history. After rapping on Forever, he and then writing partner Akiva Goldsman jumped immediately into filming A Time to Kill, which led straight into WB producers wanting the duo back on a Batman sequel. Right off the bat, things started getting very what happened-y. WB wanted to fast-track the project for a summer 1997 premiere, barely two years after Forever. Previously, WB had maintained a three-year lead time between Batman films, but since Forever had recovered so well from the less successful Batman Returns, hey, it's Batmania! Let's just all cash in! Schumacher gathered up the same production crew that he had on Forever and started filming in September of 96. Goldsman, for his part, was nervous about how fast everything was moving, and we're just gonna put a pin to this thought for now because it's gonna batarang back around to relevance later on. While Batman Forever was no stranger to merchandising, I miss you so much, baby, there was still money being left on the table. Thus, toy companies were invited to give input early in the creative process so as to figure out how to get that money off the metaphorical table. Although Forever had intentionally been made to be lighter than its Tim Burton predecessors, a change that appeared to have paid off since it handily trounced Returns' as financials, it still delved into Bruce's traumas, showed Dick Grayson's entire family getting murked live on stage, and even threw a little body whore in there as a treat. For Batman and Robin, logically, WB wanted something even more family-friendly. No pearls hitting the floor, no one getting hit with crowbars. Instead, Batman would be more cheery and crack jokes. In fact, everyone would be cracking jokes this time around. Search up! Stay cool, bird boy. I'm a lover, not a fighter. And you are? Batgirl. That's not awfully PC. As for the cast, Mr. Freeze and Poison Ivy were plucked from the rogues gallery. And of course, because we had two villains last time, we gotta one-up that in some way. So they took one of Batman's most iconic 90s villains, Bane, and put him on goon duty under Poison Ivy. While Chris O'Donnell returned as Robin, Val Kilmer's Batman was out. Joel Schumacher and Iceman famously didn't see eye to eye with each other on set. In fact, in the Hollywood Reporter article, Batman and Robin at 20, Schumacher said, Batman forever. When we were on the world tour, it just really went to his head. I'm not going to get into that. He wanted to do Island of Dr. Moreau because Marlon Brando was going to be in it, so he dropped us at the 11th hour. You know, to be fair to Val, he was fucked no matter which of these projects he chose. 
George Clooney, however, was cheap and available, so they started molding his codpiece right away. For Poison Ivy, Schumacher offered the role to Uma Thurman, as he was a huge fan of hers, citing a Vanity Fair photoshoot and her role as Venus in The Adventures of Baron Munchausen as motivators to cast her. Robert Swenson, fresh off a short stint at WCW, would be cast as a suitably large Bane. And finally, Alicia Silverstone of Clueless fame was cast as Batgirl, Ants. as Schumacher realized there weren't really female superheroes in the film space at this time, so this was an attempt to reach out to that audience. As for Mr. Freeze, Joel had said that he had always wanted a big chiseled dude for the part, and since he and Arnold had been looking for a project together, his talents were quickly purchased, but they wouldn't come cheap. Uh, getting the feeling of coming in the gym, I'm getting the feeling of coming at home, I'm getting the feeling of coming. Even though his recent films had been seeing a bit of a frostier reception, <laughs> he was still the biggest star of the show, commanding a cool $25 million salary despite spending only about a month on set. I, wait, wait, why didn't you just cast him as Bane instead? I am Bane, and I could kill you! Instead, I will simply break you! Most of the film was shot on WB's back lot in under five months, with a few major issues plaguing the production. Arnold apparently took over four hours to get costumed up, with almost two hours of that spent doing a frankly excellent job hiding his hair since he opted to not shave his head. His costume also included an array of blue LEDs in his mouth, which at some point started leaking battery acid after interacting with his saliva for long enough. The crew knew something was amiss when Arnold shouted, and I quote, What's in my mouth? Now it tastes like shit! After the device was upgraded to a more mouth-friendly one, it still maintained another crippling effect. The batteries would only last around 20 minutes and need constant replacing, putting Arnold out of commission pretty regularly. Makeup artist Jeff Don recalled, Arnold is sitting there in this incredibly uncomfortable suit and it's costing us $5,000 a minute to wait. Compounding matters further was a clause in Arnold's contract, which was a strict 12 hour per day limit. If the makeup process took over four hours, they would need to make up for that time elsewhere. One of their solutions was to make multiple, less complex suits for stuntmen who could play Arnold in wide shots and other less direct angles since his on-set time was so limited, only using him for what was absolutely necessary. It also didn't help that all these suits cost a pretty penny. Surprise! Sloppy costume work was also hampering Chris O'Donnell, who found his new duds less comfortable and harder to act in than what he wore in forever. What's more is that his new mask was held in place by glue in such a way that sweat would pool up inside of it. Ugh, yuck, 90s sweat. Since this was her first movie with elaborate stunts, Alicia Silverstone had to train rigorously and even learn to ride a motorcycle for her role as Batgirl. Unfortunately, at the same time, she had been getting attacked by the media and privately mocked by staff members of the film. Cruel jabs from the media included things like calling her Fat Girl. On set, there were rumors that she was having trouble fitting into her tight costume and she was ridiculed by members of the production for this, with storyboard artist Tim Burgard going so far as to illustrate a fake movie poster for Clueless 2, the casting of Batgirl. This included an unflattering cartoon that nearly got him in trouble because he didn't actually sign it, so it remained anonymous at the time. He claims it was meant to look like the comic book character and not Alicia and that it was a private joke, just the guys in the art department. To his credit, Joel Schumacher came to her defense by openly scolding the media's treatment of her and admonishing his crew. Speaking of Schumacher, he began to begrudge WB's push for the film to be more toyetic than forever. Characters in the movie world will wind up having more gear, accessories, and suits than ever before, such as the extremely arbitrary black and silver costume change that the three heroes undergo towards the end of the film. They didn't serve any real function, but it did give them an opportunity to make new toys. Chris O'Donnell also felt that this shift hurt the final product, 
In Batman Forever, things felt much sharper and more focused, and it just felt like everything got a little softer on the second one. The first one felt like I was making a movie. The second one, I felt like I was making a toy commercial. Alright, I can't dance around it much longer. Much noise was made over the cod pieces and nipples of Batman Forever, and they came back with a bang in Batman and Robin. I asked for a bigger package. <laughs> Apparently Chris was tipping the costume. Schumacher didn't understand the big issue during production, saying they were modeled after the physique of ancient Greek or Roman statues, which were always very superhero-like. The nipples, that was the greatest, that was the absolute greatest. That those two rubber things the size of a pencil erasers would be a big effing deal. Even with this mess of private and public issues, WB execs were apparently blown away by what they were seeing. And I mean really blown away. Before they'd even seen a rough cut of the whole film, they offered Schumacher a deal for another sequel, as they were so sure this was going to result in another boffo box office. More on this later. When filming wrapped in January of 97, it was passed directly over to the visual effects team, with no possibility of reshoots or pickups given the lack of time available before the preordained release date. Batman and Robin was positioned as the midsummer tentpole film once again, with toys, blankets, and promotions already starting to roll out. Taco Bell had a contest to win a life-size replica of the Batmobile, and there was not one, but two Batman and Robin themed roller coasters under construction. Delays were deemed unacceptable, and so on June 20th, Batman and Robin POWED and OOFED into theaters. It quickly became the laughingstock of audiences and critics alike. Too jokey, too hokey, and lacking the qualities that made the earlier films resonate with fans. Forever had at least been a novel fusion of Burton and Schumacher's sensibilities, but Batman and Robin was something else altogether. Poor reviews and bad word of mouth were tough enough to deal with, but on top of that, it also faced some serious competition just a week later, with the back-to-back -back combo of Disney's Hercules and the best-reviewed movie of the year, don't let any other facts tell you otherwise, John Woo's Face Off. No, wait, hang on, you think that's a joke that, that I'm bringing up Face Off? Face Off actually did beat Batman and Robin at the box office with only half of the production budget that it had. Let that sink in. But its first weekend box office take wasn't a complete disaster, with the Bat and Bird pulling in almost $43 million. Not bad in its own right, but it was still $10 million less than Forever's first weekend haul from just two years ago. You got a real gratitude problem, you know that, Bruce? Eventually, Batman and Robin would also wind up raking in less overall with its final worldwide tally, topping out at just over $238 million compared to Forever's stunning $336. If that wasn't enough, Batman and Robin also commanded a budget that was 60% larger than Forever's, at a whopping 160 mil. Warner Brothers chose to immediately pump the brakes on this runaway Batmobile, scrapping plans for the fifth film in this saga. Yeah, I didn't stutter. Now it's time to briefly dip our toes into the sequel that never was. Akiva Goldsman had chosen not to continue his work on the series, so Schumacher had turned to one Mark Protosevich to draft the follow-up. Batman Unchained. It would have focused on Scarecrow, as well as Harley Quinn, rewritten to be the Joker's daughter, and have even featured the return of Jack Nicholson in that role. Uh, how do you ask? Through fear gas-induced hallucinations bouncing around inside of Bruce's brain. I am genuinely sad we never got this, because it sounds so goddamn bonkers. What's even more bonkers, though, is that WB also had plans to fast-track this one in the same way as Batman and Robin, as it was set to release only two years later in the summer of 1999. There had even been initial plans to sequel bait into this thing with a cameo at the end of Batman and Robin. Apparently Schumacher had approached Nicholas fucking Cage to film a quick scene as Jonathan Crane, aka Scarecrow, but that obviously and tragically fell through. After all was said and done, combination rapper slash actor Coolio ended up at the top of the shortlist to play Scarecrow, which certainly would have been something. 
In the subsequent year since its release, Schumacher had earnestly owned up to the film's problems. In a behind-the-scenes documentary, he expressed the merchandising and licensing became a very, very important part of making the film. But I also have to say, I was an adult. I was awake and I went along with it, so I'm not pointing a finger at anyone else and saying, they made me do this, right? I was there. If there's anybody watching this that, let's say, loved Batman Forever and went into Batman and Robin with great anticipation, if I've disappointed them in any way, I really want to apologize. Because it wasn't my intention. My intention was to just entertain them. In 2017, he would reaffirm these sentiments, adding, Akiva was very leery about Batman and Robin. We had a couple of very serious discussions about it, and he was right about it in the long run. The film did not end his career, although he would never make another blockbuster on the same level as Batman, but he would go on to direct features like 8mm, Tigerland, Phone Booth, and The Number 23 before passing in 2020. A lot of lessons were obviously learned on Batman and Robin, evidently even on the WB side. Because since its debut, each subsequent interpretation of The Dark Knight seems to double down on outgridding whatever came before. Riddle me this, Buttman. If quizzes are quizzical, then what are tests? Now, some fans still feel that a fun, light-hearted take on the character has its own charm and place in the cinematic world. I never leave the cave without it. But those people are wrong. If you know of any other Bat-tastic blunders, let me know in the comments below, over on my Twitter, or break through the skylight of the Flophouse VIP Patreon, become a big boss, and nominate what you want to see in the future. See you next time, and thanks for watching!